I want to introduce Philip Morris, who is going to help us with this next, uh, the last part of our presentation, and ask our panelists to come up um, at the front of the table, please. So Philip Morris is a columnist for The Plain Dealer. He's a strong voice advocating for responsibility to one's community, and we heard a lot of those themes in the presentations earlier today. Um, so his orientation uh, dovetails well with the con uh, concepts that we're talking about today. So we're so grateful for your participation, and I'll turn it over to you, Philip. This is the part of the program that uh, should probably come with a strong disclaimer. Uh, so I'm, I'm a political journalist uh, focused mostly on affairs of state and local government. And I don't really spend a lot of time covering medicine or writing about diseases, but this is something that, uh, it's an issue that I'm, I'm very concerned about, so I was pleased to ask to come to be a part of it. Um, before I introduce the panelists, uh, Lorreen told me I could make a brief speech. That's what I normally do. Uh, so who am I and why am I here to paraphrase James Stockdale? I think the answers to um, both of those questions are simple. I'm just a guy that likes to ask questions and seek answers from people who are focused on problem solving. So in that light, we are definitely extremely fortunate to have the assembled panelists that we have, as well as this impressive audience uh, of people who spend considerable amounts of time thinking of ways to better understand and address America and the world's HIV AIDS crisis. It, it is through panels like this and discussions like this that we create the best conditions for a public breakthrough towards a better understanding of how to address our, our community viral load. And it's through efforts like this that we gain a better public understanding of how we can better work together to avoid the traps of inexcusable cross-purpose or redundancies. It's through discussions like this that we can finally begin to move toward, or move beyond rather, the HIV, HIV care and prevention silos and into a more complete understanding of a preventable <coughs> and manageable disease that continues to unnecessarily wreak havoc on our community, on our neighbors, friends, and loved ones. Uh, but before we hear from our panel, and I open this up to the audience, I would be somewhat remiss if I didn't at least briefly acknowledge the role that mainstream media could but fails to play in further advancing an understanding of the issue at hand. The media could play a much more pivotal role in advancing this discussion and saving lives if we approached it with the same sense of urgency that we approached the latest Britney Spears mishap, the Cleveland Browns, or with the same sense of curiosity with which we approached the need to capture photos of the latest celebrity marriage or celebrity birth. We've become fairly adroit at covering stories revolving around World's AIDS Day or providing wire service feedback from international symposiums on the disease, but we do an exceedingly poor job of covering the story of the teenage boy it is having unprotected sex with men or other boys and becoming afflicted. We do a poor job of examining the fact that incidence of HIV is on the rise again in New York City and other major metropolitan areas. Even though we now know more about the disease than ever and public service messages can be found on the sides of buses, in malls, billboards, and on primetime television. So the discussion obviously must evolve beyond highlighting the terror of the disease and the modes of transmission and into a discussion of how to avoid behaviors and recognize complicated pathologies that put us all at physical, emotional, and financial risk. So with that ramble of a preamble, I'll introduce our illustrious panel. We'll start with uh, Dr. Ann Avery. Ann is an infectious disease physician at Metro Health Medical Center and in that role, she works at the individual level providing medical care for people living with HIV AIDS. She's also co-medical director of Cleveland Department of Public Health, and in that role focuses at the community level to ensure the health of our community. Next we have Denise Smith. Denise, excuse me. Denise has been in the field of social work for 23 years and in HIV care for 10 years. She is a social work supervisor and provides care management to clients who are HIV positive. She says, quote, my greatest, most rewarding, yet most challenging, difficult part of my career has without a doubt been in the area of HIV. It has, it has fulfilled my life in ways I cannot describe. My life has been forever enriched by so many lives I've been fortunate enough to be part of through my HIV work experience, end of quote. Next, we have Lloyd Lee Williams. Uh, Lee has been living with HIV for nearly 25 years. 
Among his numerous leadership roles in the community, he serves on the executive committee of the Ryan White Planning Council, the body responsible for making decisions about the allocation of resources to provide medical care and wraparound services for people living with HIV and AIDS in our community. And finally, we have Tracy Jones. Tracy has been Chief Operating Officer of the AIDS Task Force of Greater Cleveland for eight years. Prior to that, she was the HIV Prevention Coordinator and AIDS Coordinator at the Cleveland Department of Public Health, a position she came to after two and a half years of teaching HIV prevention to high-risk heterosexual women and teens. Our panelists will now and each provide a brief reaction to the presentations that they've heard in the context of the roles uh, in the community. And I, I, I believe we'll start with Anne, and if it's okay, uh, then we'll hear from Denise, then Lloyd, then Tracy, and then after that, we'll open it up for some give and take between the audience and the panelists. Anne. Thank you. Um, so, as a provider of HIV care um, in a clinic, I actually only take care of patients that are in care for the most part. They may come in and out of care, but it strikes me that right now as a provider of care, we decide on treatment based upon symptoms of the disease or measures in a lab test of their immune system. We don't really take into account their viral load and how infectious they are to their community, although we do want to work to take care of their um, associated risk factors of substance abuse and mental health. So this talk about community viral load makes me take pause and think about some of my patients who have very healthy immune statuses but do run with high viral loads and most likely are out having um, sex. And I think about now changing my conversation as a provider of care to one that includes not only the prevention of risk behavior but also incorporating taking the medicine or even considering medicine at a different point in time based upon prevention to a community. Um, and I think that is a conversation as medical providers will need to be looking at as we expand treatment to a larger group. Um, I'm not going to mention the out of care group. Good afternoon. Until now, my work has uh, primarily been on the individual level of care, I've, and I've always been a person who firmly believes that if I can touch one life as a social worker or a human being, um, that is so important. One life makes a difference, and I have made a difference in one person's life, no matter how minute that may seem. However, the longer I work in this field of HIV, and the longer I, I, I am in the clinic, day to day and, and watching young people come into the clinic horrified that they've got this disease and not knowing what their future holds for them. The more I realize that what we're doing, while it is good and we're saving and saving lives and enriching the quality of people's lives, it's not enough. It's just not enough and that is one reason that we in our clinic have started a community outreach program. The concept of community viral load as it relates and as it relates to HIV prevention was is is was uh, sorry it's something that is very very important to me and it's something that I did not easily grasp right away you can ask anyone on the panel and I am a bit nervous still but after a little relaxation vacation I had time to really think about it and the implications for social work are so many. I mean, we could go crazy with this. And who better to, to do community organization than social workers? We are trained and prepared in this area. And um, contrary to what some people think, it is a very important role. And I, I'm sorry, I went there. <laughs> um, <laughs> so in treatment, we again have individuals who come to us with all kinds of pre-diagnosis baggage. And we need to address these social issues before they come into us. In preparation for today, each of us on the panel was asked, what, how are you accountable as a professional and, uh, and, and personally in helping to prevent HIV and, and, and in looking at community viral load? 
I, this is manifold for me. As a professional person, I think that, first of all, we've got to get out of our nice little offices and go and take our message to the people, go where they are. We are always talking about as social workers starting where the patient is or starting where the client is. We need to actually go out there and get the correct information out there. I feel that we have many skills, such as problem-solving skills, that can help. We can empower, we can educate, and mentor. We lead by example. And these are things that we all can do. These are the basic foundations of social work. We also have to remember to fight for social injustice everywhere. Um, and that includes racism, ageism, sexism domestic violence issue, issues, homophobia. As, a, as a, a black American female, I also feel a responsibility. As a mother of three young sons, I feel a responsibility at many levels. I have sons who are growing up in a world where they, are, they know that they, as black males, are at the bottom of the totem pole. I have sons who have yet to date. That I have a stake in this. I think we all have a stake in this. And we can't just see our jobs as social workers or whatever we are in the field of HIV as an eight hour a day job. We've got to be committed. It takes, I feel like I should stop. I, <laughs> we've got to be committed. We've got to go back to our nice uh, little suburban neighborhoods and our strong churches and we've got to reach those people. I also have personally experienced a loss. Uh, from afar, I watched a cousin of mine who was infected with this disease, and I saw him refuse, I heard that he refused to go to the hospital out of fear and stigma. So there's a lot of work we can do, a lot of work at many levels. Uh, I just like to challenge everyone to think about what it is that you can do. I know what I can do from a social work standpoint, professional standpoint, as a female. I can empower, as a black female, I can empower the women I know, the black women, and make sure that they have all the knowledge and so that they can make better informed choices about lifelong decisions. I can also talk to young girls as a role model and talk to them about feeling good about themselves so that they're not in a situation where they're making decisions based on some need for love or misguided uh, love that they think they found. So having said all that, I guess I leave with you just this challenge to see and think about how it is you impact, how you can impact HIV prevention on all of those levels in your profession personally as well. <laughs> when Lorene called me and asked me about being on the panel, I guess the first thing I thought of was, you know, when she mentioned the words community viral load, I never thought, I mean, I've had, I have no problem disclosing the fact that I'm a homosexual male, that I'm biracial, that I'm HIV positive and have been for almost 25 years. I've talked to many youth groups. I mean, basically anybody who calls me and wants me to come and talk to people, I have no problem doing it. And the concept of community viral load, it's like I know what my viral load is. And when David was talking earlier about like the actual, the, the areas where the most concentrated people are, those are areas that have basically a high community viral load. And so when I talk to people now, I have a better understanding of, you know, letting people know that, you know, just because you only have unprotected sex once because you're doing it in such a high viral load area, it makes it even worse, you know? And I'm, I'm, I almost get confused sometimes because I don't understand. I go and talk to people because I don't want people to go through what I'm living with every day. I take medicines in the morning, I take them at night. I mean, I've been through all the side effects and you know all that, and I'm used to it, you know. And a lot of people just still don't get it. You have a lot of people who honestly feel like, okay, well, if I get it, so what? I'll just take the meds, I'll get on Social Security, and I'll live happily ever after. And you honestly have people who think this way, and we as a community have to educate people. I mean, 
all the, the for all the programs they have, nothing is guaranteed tomorrow. I mean, it's one thing to say, okay, well, you know, the government set up these Ryan White programs. Okay, that's fine. But when they set them up, it was a different time. People weren't living as long. You know, we have to really look at everything seriously enough to make a change because when I was speaking with Ron earlier, the one thing that kept popping in my mind is when you do the same thing and you get the same result, at some point you have to change up. You know, you have to actually start doing things differently. You have to do things a different way to get a, a better result. And hopefully one day, you know, community forums will be the, the catalyst to start it all. We never know. But I'm glad I was here and I'm glad to be a part of it. And that's pretty much all I have to say. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I first became familiar with the, the concept of community viral, viral load earlier this year. And I remember walking away from a community discussion with uh, women uh, and primarily African American women uh, feeling like, oh my goodness, we got a real problem here. Um, when we all sat down to talk, we talked a lot about how this information should and must inform our prevention work. Um, as we look at all the different principles of work that are just in this room today, all of us are responsible to provide prevention education to all of those that we interact with, whether professionally or personally. Um, and one of the things that was really startling for me when I started to think about how this impacts our work is we've basically said to people, make sure that you're monogamous. If you're not going to be monogamous, make sure that you use a condom every time you have an interaction with someone else. Well, we know when we say that, that the, the voice on the side of our head is women typically don't have the ability to control those issues to the degree that we would like them to have. You know, if you ask a woman, um, especially a woman of color, typically she's going to assure you that that's not the case for her because that's what we've been socialized to do and socialized to believe, that you must make sure that you're the strong person in your family. And this translates to all other communities, um, especially marginalized communities of women. But one of the things that's really important about that is they don't necessarily have that much control over how that, um, how that plays out in the bedroom. Short of a flashlight, you're not going to know the answer to that question anyway. Um, but one of the things that struck me is the conversation needs to be brought into it is, you know, now, who you are, what you do, and where you live. It's like, oh my God, you know, because we've been pushing back, pushing back, saying it's about behaviors, it's about behaviors, it's about behaviors. Make sure that if you're having uh, sex with someone, you use a condom every time. But this concept overlaid on top of that means that you've also got to say to people, the sheer fact that you are living in a community that's dense and the population, based on the chart, shows that there's a lot of HIV infection where you live we also have to have this honest conversation about, you know, one interaction could be problematic for you. You know, so it's no longer this ideal of just be monogamous. Because for some of us, you know, if you're a single person, monogamy looks a lot like, oh, I like him, he's wonderful, I had sex with him, we went out for six weeks, oh, I found out he's a giant behind hole. I've moved on to the next one. <laughs> and by the end of the year, that could look like six, eight people, where you've had interactions, where at some point in time during that relationship, you've said, I'm comfortable with you enough that I'm going to take condoms off. So it's not enough anymore to have that conversation in a vacuum. We've got to have that larger conversation, which is even more painful, because now we're saying to you, in fact, where you live impacts your ability to continue to keep yourself safe. So I guess the thing, the takeaway message for me is our prevention work isn't getting easier. It's getting a little more challenging. And we have to continue to push, push, push to let people know everything that we know and be as open and as transparent as possible because we could be rendering the po people that we most hope to help powerless. At the end of that conversation, a woman then says to me, but I did everything you told me to do and I still got infected. Uh, I have a question that I'll, I'll throw out to all the panelists, and then I think at some point, Lorraine would like to, uh, any members of the audience who might have a question or a reaction to also be able to, uh, to um, uh, weigh in. Um, 
when we talk about reaching um, this, this underground audience, to borrow an expression that I heard uh, during uh, one of the presentations, uh, these folks who are driving a community's viral load, how do we really go about reaching them? I mean, we've gotten people to uh, wear seat belts, to stop smoking in bars. How do we make it a community norm that you are going to wear a condom every time out, that you are uh, going to get tested? Uh, and beyond the individual responsibil uh, responsibility question, how do we advance the whole notion that a community itself must recognize the role that it has to play in addressing the viral load? And I throw that out to any of the panelists. Karis, step in. I think that we have to, we are a society, America is a culture that is in the closet about sex, period. And we've got to come together and find out a way, just start talking about it and making it okay. I mean, it's everybody's, I remember growing up and it was, well, that's his business. That's, that's your own personal business. Well, now it's not. It is our business. This is our future, our kids who are going to be out there at risk. So somehow I think we have to open those doors and start the conversations like we are here. Sure. Anne? Yeah, um, I also wanted to add on, and for people who know me, this is a recurring theme, um, is the idea of testing and normalizing testing and having everybody get tested, get tested at least once and have all providers be comfortable with testing and really targeting the frontline providers that are accessing and seeing those at risk and um, high risk um, individuals living in those areas of high viral load and then making sure that once individuals are identified that there are successful linkages to get back into care or start care if they um, are newly diagnosed. I'd like to add some ideas at the level of community. Okay, the, when you look at the CDC data sets and look at HIV from the point of view of health disparities by race, HIV is the poster child for HIV disparities. African American women are 50 times more likely to be infected with HIV than are European American women. African American men are approximately 30 times more likely to be infected with HIV than are European American Americans. Now does anybody in this room think that black women are 50 times more risky than white women? Or black men are 50 times or 30 times riskier than white men? So leaving it at the level of individual ex uh, behavior cannot explain the health disparity. It's just that simple. So we need to do the stuff that works. We need to get the message out. If you're in a, if you're in a community with high viral load, you're even riskier. But the other thing that we need to do is get people tested, but we've also got to do the political work to make sure that HIV positive people can get the care that they need. Knowing you're positive doesn't give you health insurance. It does not get you antiretroviral care. And until we get positives into treatment and work with them to keep them safe over the long haul and make sure that they understand that they can get care, and it will keep them alive. And it's good not only for them, but for their community. You know, we can't stop the epidemic. So we've also got to do the work about fighting for health care and fighting for health care that will work for our communities. So we do the stuff that works on the individual level, but we also have got to think about the community work and in particular access to medical care. Otherwise, we cannot put a dent in this epidemic. So we need the right people in office. <laughs> now, I did not turn this into that kind of... <laughs> I would add to that, um, it, it almost feels like at times that we are pitted against, you know, it's either prevention or it's care and service. And they, they are, it's not an and or. To think that we pull back on prevention in the hopes of putting more dollars into care and services and fixing the problem is so short-sighted. The bottom line is if your prevention messages aren't strong, aren't constant, aren't tailored to a community where you can get that normalization because it's there, it's there, it's there, you see it, it's in everything and it becomes ingrained in the fabric and the, the white noise of your life, then the silence around preventioning, prevention is deafening. So it's got to be the two things together. 
and Ron, on the line of um, the testing, I think we have to go out and take our testing sites into the community. Amen. <laughs> yeah, in, in, in that light, I'm sorry, was someone in the audience saying something? Oh, okay. Amen, sister. Uh, but <laughs> in that light, I, I have a question that I would like to direct towards um, Lloyd. Uh, I, I think you are really a, a courageous community leader whose efforts definitely should be better amplified. Um, and in that light, I, I was wondering if you could speak to the notion that there may be people in the community uh, who are HIV positive and know it, but can't or won't access um, care. Uh, and if so, what could we better do to promote a sense of urgency as well as highlight the availability of resources that are out there? I had this conversation yesterday. I have a friend who found out he was positive and the stigma is still greater than the desire to live. Honestly, when you have a person that says, I won't go to the task force because if I go in there, I'm going to run into somebody I've seen at the club. Everybody's going, I mean, confidentiality is the big key thing. A lot of people don't want to come to UH hospital because they go into the Foley clinic, everybody in there is for the same thing, you know, but at least he made the decision to go to the free clinic because when he goes in there, it's like, you don't know what he's in there for, and he can be kind of anonymous. But I mean, people do things for different reasons. I mean, I've sat in support groups and heard people basically say that I don't disclose to anybody because nobody disclosed to me. I have a problem with that. I have been HIV positive for over 20 years. I have never, not once, ever had sex with somebody who did not know what HIV meant, that I was positive, and I used protection. I've not had any other disease since then, and I mean, I, I'm doing my part. And the whole notion of whose responsibility is it? Is it my responsibility to tell you I'm positive before we have sex, or is it your responsibility to protect yourself? It's like, it, it's both. I think it's 50-50, and that's just, people are gonna do what they're gonna do. You know, my doctor, or my main medical person is sitting here looking at me, and she knows for a fact. I mean, there were times when, you know, I just stopped taking my meds because I needed a break. You know, looking at that, I wasn't thinking about, okay, well, I'm just going to, you know, take a six-week break or a six-month break or whatever, and then my viral load is going to shoot up. How am I supposed to know that's going to affect my community? You know what I mean? And it's just really weird. It's like this whole concept really puts a lot more things into perspective for myself. You know, and yes, I'm taking my meds. <laughs> uh, Ron, if the stigma is still greater than the will to live uh, on the part of many um, afflicted, how do we as a community begin to attack a stigma like that? I mean, obviously the billboards and the public service messages aren't going far enough. Yeah. Well. I've always thought it was such an odd thing in terms of HIV prevention strategy that we make the person who has the most to lose, the HIV positive person, do the disclosing. Why not an I'm negative campaign where before anyone has sex with anybody, you make sure that you're negative and as you start that relationship, you tell your partner, I'm negative. Now, if your partner is positive and is like your friend who does not, or the folks in that support group who will not disclose, they know, okay, I have to be especially careful with this person. Because one of the things that goes on is when, especially on the gay male side, when two men who don't know each other have high risk sex and one of them is positive, the positive guy assumes that the other guy must have been positive because who would be that stupid? And the negative guy assumes that the positive guy must have been negative because who would be a murderer like that? And so, and so there's that divide that's based on assumptions. But if you stop the assumptions in, by putting the weight on the disclosure side, on the person who has the least to lose, maybe that'll help. It could also help that when HIV is raised at all, the positive person could say, hey, I'm positive. You know, and then, and then they could, you, but your chances of getting that conversation going are maybe higher when it's the, when it's the negative person who starts it. It's, it's less of a burden. The other thing is, is that on the African-American MSM side, 
that the CDC data showed in, in their big behavioral survey that half of the men in that survey, approximately half, were infected already. And two-thirds of them did not know it. So that ev so even relying on disclosure doesn't help because a lot of those guys probably were identifying as negative, right? All right? So we have to get people into testing. Well, what we're doing now with testing is we're telling everybody to get tested. Um, Dr. Wilbur Jordan in L.A. hit on a very smart idea. He started asking guys, people rather, in Los Angeles who were newly identified as positive, he goes, why don't you bring in your friends? Under the idea that birds of a feather flock together. And he, start, he claimed in, in, his, in his clinic that he had the, the rate of new positives going from 1% in his clinic to 20% by asking people, newly infected positives, to bring in their friends who they thought might be at risk. We tested that idea at the Centers for Disease Control and the, 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 we, trialed it, we tried it with 15 different clinics around the United States. This has been published in MMWR. And the first year, we, the, the organizations we were working with had a hard time getting their, hands around, their heads around this. So the first year data weren't so good, but even so, we had a 500% increase in the number of identifying new positives. So one thing we can start to do is in our alternative test sites, start getting smarter about how we're using existing services. And, and using social network approaches, when you find a new positive, um, when you find someone with syphilis, ask them to bring in their friends as part, you know, who may be at risk as part of your responsibility to the community to identify new positives. So relying on disclosure alone won't help, in a lot of ways, highly impacted communities. And then the last thing I keep harping on this, once people are positive, they have to know that, they're, that they do, that it is possible then for them to get into care and this will keep them alive longer and it will be good for them and it will be good for their communities. And that message still isn't out there. That reality still isn't out there. Um, yeah, sure, sir. I had a question. Back in the 80s and the early 90s, you know, we knew certain places weren't the best places to have sex, you know, New York, San Francisco, Boston, whatever. Wasn't that really our recognition of community by the moment at that time? And what's the, what new message are you trying to get out today? Well, I think th this is more about the than avoiding the hot spots of the epidemic. This is more about um, what Tracy was saying, is that it's not treatment or prevention, it's treatment and prevention. And that we've got to, we've got to combine these in a much smarter way. And we've got to look at multiple mechanisms of prevention efficacy in the same way that we're using multiple mechanisms of treatment efficacy to affect the epidemic. So that we're not, the, the treatment world and the prevention world is not working across purposes. We're all at the same goal. And finding ways to better integrate these things to lower the proportion in a community who are still viremic and still efficient transmitters is the goal. And, and so working to meld things together at the community level is, 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 is the new message, not uh, taking um, San Francisco or New York off your party list. <laughs> uh, we have to get David into this conversation briefly. Um, you uh, shared with us some actually absolutely horrifying numbers about the, uh, the trend toward younger and younger people becoming infected uh, with the gateway diseases as well as uh, HIV AIDS. What can, we do as a, what can we as a city and a county better do to address this, this trend? Well, I have to say that there's, um, you know, we have community leaders who are aware that denial is, is one of the worst things that, that can occur in a, in a community. That the fact that we have put resources in order to get these numbers out, um, that the, the Plain Dealer, the you know, media, you know, Radio One and other media sources help us out to get this message across, that STD is a real problem, I mean a real, real problem. Just a few, just a year ago, the University of Chicago in the big city's health inventory um, queued up all of the data on, on health indicators for 45 major cities. And we came out at number two in, in the country for chlamydia. Number one was Cincinnati. Okay, so that tells you that they're, you know, at the state level, we, we've got a problem. You know, we've got a problem of denial that there is a problem. We're number seven for 
for gonorrhea, I believe Cincinnati is, is still above us. The, the fact that we can at least get the message out is important. But it, it, it doesn't just start with us, it starts in the home. It, it starts at the dinner table with parents or parent. It, and, and it even starts, you know, with brothers and sisters who can tell their younger siblings that, hey, there's stuff out there you have to be aware of. And, and so, you know, we've, we feel, at least in, in public health, that there is a big role in personal responsibility. Um, you know, we can only go so far to put the message out, but people have to realize that, that this is not, you know, this is bigger than, than safety belts. This, this is something that really impacts, you know, people on, on a daily basis. And, and it's not, you know, one, one thing I wanted to get back to when it came to um, a community viral load and, and how this meshes with what we do in public health. You know, when, when I put up maps and, and, and it shows the, the prevalence of cases in certain areas, you know, keep in mind that, you know, this, these are just where people live. It, it doesn't mean that they're hooking up there. It doesn't mean that, you know, that's where they're, they're finding their partners. They're finding partners on the internet or at clubs or anonymously or in parking lots or, you know, at dances or, or anywhere. Uh, so that, you know, our behavior for community viral load doesn't necessarily, you know, ring true for a residence, but we also have to look at the word unity in community. And that means that it's with whom you congregate and with whom you're hooking up and with whom your friends are and that we all owe a responsibility to them, whether it's STD, whether it's HIV, whether it's hepatitis. I think we have to take a, we can take this and really extend it to a much more holistic view of what we owe to everyone else. Mm -hmm. All right, I see a few hands. Uh, Mr. Carroll? Thank you. Uh, just quickly, Ron, are there um, communities that have embraced and understood the viral load concept and the prevention cocktail concept with some best practices that you might uh, point to? Um, I think San Francisco is playing around with it now, um, but I don't think anyone's put it in place. And I think that's the hundred thousand. This is all very abstract, and there, there are some things that you could do that are, would be smart first starts. Um, one of them would be, I would think, like you, you could think about like the substance abuse treatment system. The substance abuse treatment system is very efficient at, at finding HIV positive people. Well, what would happen if you tried to basically see what would happen if you integrated HIV pre prevention and care inside of the sub uh, substance abuse treatment agency? What would happen in terms of reducing high-risk sex by people in substance abuse treatment and, and lowering viral load in, in, in substance abuse communities where it's likely to operate with a particular vengeance? You could make the same argument for violence. So if you have, if you have in a big city, um, a um, young gay man who's there looking for refuge because his partner's beating him up, he should be screened for substance abuse, he should be screened for HIV, and you should provide him a place where he can escape from an abusive relationship. That goes for all uh, you know, victims of abusive relationships. So that we could start to think about unifying um, services in a way that are going to be much smarter and making more effective everything we're doing. Uh, that same person, you can be sure, is depressed. And all of that's going to make that, all of the combination of problems, violence, depression, substance abuse, it's going to make them far more likely to be risky. And, and then getting HIV in the mix doesn't help. So that those would be some of the ways I would start. I would start small. I would start with really smart things and see if you could then build it, see what happens, and then wrap the next thing around. Um, I would not do a top-down thing where everybody has to behave in this new paradigm. I'd, I'd show them that it works first. Ma'am, over here. And they denied it because they couldn't put it into a category that they had designated in their board. And yet we have people that are affected uh, uh, by this disease and, and, and dying by this disease. I didn't understand that, but now listening to you talk about that, I was on target. They just what? <laughs> you still have a copy of the proposal? <laughs> Back here. Yes, you. Me? Yes, you. Okay. <laughs> um, my name is Kelly. I'm a social worker at the AIDS Gas Alert. 
administrator. And I am interested in hearing from Ron Stahl about how ART adherence, um, what you envision ART adherence, uh, how it can be implemented in the prevention cocktail and by whom. And like, do you envision ART adherence like community level messages or? I just want to give you a laugh. Yeah. Well, the, the issue is, of course, is that when, when positive people are on antiretroviral cocktails, the issue is, is that they have to use lots of different drugs in, in lots of different combinations. There are side effects it, and there are timings. You can take some with food, you can't. And so these are very complicated medical um, regimens. Uh, Lee, Lee was right that it's, it's difficult to do this over the long haul and, and, and that some people want to take a break. Um, and that, that's all reasonable. Um, the, the, I, the, the suspicion had been early in the, in, the, in the ART era, the heart cocktail era, that HIV positive people would have an extraordinarily difficult time adhering to medications and would not be able to do it. It was also known that if you did not adhere to the medications that, that you would develop a treatment resistant virus and, and, and pretty soon the, the medications wouldn't work for you. What we have found in practice is, is that people do a lot better than you might think. I think the, the data sets that have been most impressive for me have been the one that Dave, ones that David Bangsberg has generated about homeless HIV positive people being able to adhere to heart medications to the point that they, they are not developing treatment resistant viruses. It's, it's extraordinary. So positive people are doing far better than anyone thought at the beginning. Also the medications are getting better. So that there are now medications that's, you know, like the, you can, that is conceivable. Uh, there, it's one option. You can do one pill a day options now for people who haven't been on other medications. Now, now most people have more complicated regimens, but still it's there. But the issue is, is that again, folks who are substance abusers, folks who are depressed, uh, folks who are homeless, folks who have lots of different problems are going to have a harder time adhering. And, and if that is the case in those populations, are more likely to, to develop resistance to the medications and they won't be as effective. So that we've, again, the best way to, to to deal with the antiretroviral adherence issues is again thinking about the intercombination, the syndemic of epidemics, making substance abuse treatment, mental health services, violence um, um, prevention, and all the rest of it as part of the basket of services. It's standard medical care for HIV positive people. This will work better to reduce levels of high risk sex, improve adherence, and improve levels of health throughout the community. Again, it's all about making our systems of medical care work for us. Uh, we have time for one last question. Uh, we'll go with you. Um, afterwards, if any of you have a burning question, maybe some of our panelists will be willing to stick around for a couple extra minutes. Uh, Martha? Okay. Um, I'm Martha from St. Paul's Community Outreach, and we have a small HIV prevention street outreach program. And we're going, our outreach workers go out on the street. They're talking to people, homeless, sex workers, men, women, transsexuals. And in light of all this, I'm wondering what you think our sort of highest priority should be. And we have maybe a few minutes with people to give them a safe sex kit and talk about prevention. Like, is that good enough? Saying to them, just saying to them, you do not have to get this. This is easy not to get is a start. Tracy, you deal with teenagers every day. What would you say? <laughs> um, in a few minutes in a snapshot, uh, you do everything you can to say, so tell me what you know about HIV. <laughs> um, and usually that'll give you a few more minutes with them, you know, because people want to please. Um, and one of the things that I found with teenagers is they have most of the information. Um, they might have some stuff out of order, they might have some stuff added, um, but it gives you a little bit of time to test their knowledge, to give them a little bit more information to say, why don't you come back and see me? Because I think the key in that conversation is you need more time with that individual. You know, That condom may save their life tonight, um, but you need more time. So you need to establish a rapport with that person so you can get them in to spend a little more time, a couple more sessions, give them some food, give them some music, all of the things that you know are important to help people feel whole, even when they're not really, when they're displaced. 
and then that gets you some more time to provide your message. Because when you just got a couple seconds, you just got to make the most of them. Well, it's, it's amazing what you can cram into two hours. Uh, would you join me in giving our speakers and our panelists a hand? So I mentioned the evaluations. The first thing I'm going to put on my evaluation is schedule three hours and not two. <laughs> um, so I thank you, Philip, for your role as a moderator and all of our speakers and panelists. Um, we really hope that this is just the start of this conversation and I imagine that our planning committee will get together and debrief and figure out what our next steps are and for those of you who got inspired or had an aha moment today please be in touch with us and let us know how you think we should continue this dialogue um, so please complete your evaluations if you need a continuing education certificate those will be outside um, and you can return your evaluations outside uh, there's also the parking validation outside at the registration table and I invite you to join us for refreshments in the atrium to continue the conversation and I really appreciate your being here we had never imagined we would have a packed house um, so obviously there's more to talk about and we look forward to continuing the conversation thank you